today we're going to be talking about a new species in this ant care species guide. Today we're going to focus on Manica rubida, which is a European a species that is sometimes called of a fire ant. They are the, the biggest stinging species in Europe, or at least one of the biggest, and their sting is quite painful, so they are not for beginners, but if you are comfortable with the fact that your ants may sting you if um, you get your hand in the enclosure and you start, you know, to provoke them, uh, these ants, if you go past that, they are great to keep, and even when it comes to that, they are usually quite tame. So, let's get to it. This, this species hails from the center of Europe. They go as far south as the south of Italy and as far north as Germany and Poland. They do not exist in Spain or Portugal and they do not go farther east than the southwest of Russia. You can see that in this map on the screen that is um, from Ant Maps, which is a great site that you should check out if you want to know where certain species of ant exist and whether or not they are native or introduced. Now, when it comes to the climate that you should give them, I uh, will, as always, give you a few numbers, but what you want to do is give them a gradient which you can learn how to do in this video, in the, in the video that is in the description down below. Now, when it comes to humidity, they can withstand anything from 30 to 70%, but they should not be kept at below 50 for extended periods of time, nor should you. So the best strategy is, as with most species of temperate ants, to keep the outside, which would mean the room that they are in, at 50% humidity, which is what is already found in most households in Europe, and then have the nest be slightly more humid. In the case of Manica rubida, it can be, in my experience, a little bit more humid. Now, I did keep these ants in the past, but I, um, I took a lot of care not to let them escape because though they do not exist in Portugal, they can technically live in the, in the climate that we have here, so they could become exotic and uh, at the time I didn't really think of it too much, I just, you know, I'll keep them safe, I won't, I'll, I'll take extra measures, I used the automation chalk to, if they would escape, they would die. Um, and nowadays I wouldn't keep such a species unless I knew that I could keep them perfectly, perfectly safe, which is now possible with the setup that I have in the garage. So maybe I will keep them again in the future. So, let's keep talking about climate. When it comes to temperature, they can withstand anything from 18 to 28 degrees Celsius. They can withstand it a little bit even higher than that, but it's not really good for them. The best thing to keep them at is that between 25 and 27, uh, if you keep them around that area, they will just thrive for you because that is a temperature where the development of the brood is as fast as it can be in comparison to the dying rate of workers. They hibernate from the end of October to the end of March, and they usually do this at between 5 and 8 degrees Celsius. Hibernation is, is most commonly not uh, obligatory. They can skip hibernation and keep uh, being awake through the winter, but if you want to, and if you do hibernate your ants, this is when and how you hibernate uh, Manica rubida. You can find a video also in the description down below on how to hibernate ants. That video is quite old and I'll probably be remaking it soon, but still the information is there, is valid. When it comes to sizes, the queens uh, can have between 9 and 13 millimeters, while the workers have between 6 and 9 millimeters. Now, within the same colony, there is not really a difference in size from worker to worker. They have no sort of majors or minors, it's all the same size. The queen is fairly similar in body shape to the workers. She's just slightly bigger and has a bigger thorax because of the wing muscles and the bigger abdomen because she lays eggs. She's not hard to identify, she's just quite similar to the workers, which uh, in most ant species actually doesn't happen. It's also similar in shape to the workers because she is semi clothed which means she doesn't need energy reserves when she is raising her first workers that I need it because she actually goes out and hunts. This means that when you have a queen, you can't just sort it away in a test tube and wait for the workers to arrive. You have to give the queen food, especially protein, so that she can rear up the brood into the first trinitics. From then on, she won't leave the nest again to hunt, 
and you can just have them as a normal colony. But you have to keep in mind that there is a need to feed the queen when in founding stage. They are monogenous and they start their colonies as monogenous and with a single queen they can go to, they can go to have a few hundred workers, even close to a thousand. However, as they get older they will start accepting new queens and they can become very very polygynous. And being very polygynous, a big colony, especially in the wild, can have thousands of workers. When it comes to their nuptial flight, they fly uh, somewhere between May and the and early September. However, they are most known to fly at the end of June. So there is a chance that depending on the region they will fly at some other time, but it's most common to have them fly at the end of June. When it comes to food, they eat insects, honey water, sugar water. Uh, they don't seem to be really fond of fruits, but basic sweets and insects they'll take in very eagerly. They love their insects and they hunt very eagerly. They love to hunt small insects, like fruit flies or something like that, but as a group and because they have such potent stings they can take down very big prey and are very proficient at hunting bigger insects. They're also very good at cuffing them up. They are able to get into mealworms just fine which for their size is somewhat impressive. Now uh, both workers and the queen can sting so you should keep that in mind. The, the sting is going to be very painful but it's nothing very serious unless you are allergic which would if you are, you shouldn't keep them if you know it yourself to be allergic to some insect stings. Because it can be very grave, it can be very bad if you go into anaphylactic shock, which, though the sting isn't that potent, it can technically be caused. In the wild, they usually create nests in the soil, which can be uh, as deep as 3 meters, and, but they start at the surface because they love the heat from the sun. Now, if you, ha if you want to keep them in a natural setup, you can, but they are an egg species that will take well to almost every single setup and um, ant nest that usually people use that you could give them. They are not picky or fussy about any of that and they have no characteristic that would make any type of nest unusable. The only thing that I will say is that they do eat a lot of insect guts and liquid food which means that just like Campanotas they will dirty up the sort of acrylic nests very quickly because the residue that they create is liquid and it will seep into the seam between acrylic sheets and it will make a sort of brown um, dirty layer between the acrylic which could, can look bad but isn't really necessarily something you should be concerned about, it's just more visual. So that is all about Manica Rubra, I hope that uh, Manica Rubida, sorry. I hope that you've enjoyed this, I hope that you can keep them now because this is a lot of information and uh, I thank you for watching. Follow me on Patreon I guess if you want to, the link is in the description and I'll see you in the next episode, bye bye.